All right, hello there. We're going to be um, continuing with Journey to the Center of the Earth. Um, I think we're just about ready to finish it up today, so that's very exciting. Um, we're going to can pick up where we left off with Chapter 43, Shot Out of a Volcano at Last. Yes, our compass was no longer a guide to our movements. The needle was jumping from pole to pole in a kind of frenzy. It was rushing around the dial, it was spinning giddily backwards and forwards. I knew quite well that, according to the most generally accepted theories, the mineral covering of the globe is never completely at rest. The changes brought about by the chemical decomposition of its component parts, the turbulence caused by great liquid torrents, and the magnetic currents are continually tending to disturb it, even when the living beings on its surface imagine that all is quiet below. A phenomenon of this kind would therefore not have alarmed me greatly, or at any rate, would not have given rise to dreadful apprehensions. But other peculiar circumstances gradually revealed to me the true state of affairs. There were the explosions of increasing frequency and ever greater intensity. I could only compare them to the loud clatter of dozens of carts driven at full speed over cobblestones. There was a rumbling like internal th interminable thunder. Then the compass, that had been thrown out of action by the electric currents, confirmed my worst thoughts. The mineral crust of the globe was threatening to break up. The granite foundations were going to come together with a crash. The fissure through which we were being driven helplessly would be filled up. The space would be full of crushed fragments of rock, and we poor, wretched mortals were going to be buried and annihilated in this terrible destruction. Uncle, uncle, I cried. We're doomed now, utterly doomed. What are you frightened about now? was the calm reply. What's the matter with you? The matter? Look at those shaking walls. Look at those quivering rocks. Don't you feel the burning heat? Don't you see how the water is boiling and bubbling? Are you blind to the dense vapors and steam that are growing thicker and denser with every minute? Look at the compass needle spinning. There's an earthquake coming. My uncle shook his head calmly. So, he said, you think there's an earthquake coming? I do. Well, I think you're wrong. What? Don't you recognize the signs? Of an earthquake? No. I think it's something better than that. What do you mean? It's an eruption, Axel. An eruption? Do you mean to say that we're being carried up the shaft of a volcano? I do believe we are, said the indomitable professor with an air of total self-possession. And it's the best thing that could possibly be happening to us, under the circumstances. The best thing? Was my uncle completely mad? What did this man mean? And what was the point in making jokes at a time like this? What? I shouted. Are we being carried upwards in an eruption? Fate has flung us here among burning lava, molten rocks, boiling water, and all kinds of volcanic matter. We're going to be pitched out, expelled, tossed up, vomited, sped out, high into the air, along with fragments of rock, showers of ashes and scoria, in the midst of a towering rush of smoke and flames. And you're saying it's the best thing that could happen to us? Yes, replied the professor, looking me over his spectacles. I can't see any other way of reaching the surface of the earth. I will pass rapidly over the thousand ideas which went through my mind. My uncle was right, undoubtedly right and never had he seemed to me more daring and more certain in his ideas than at this moment when he was calmly contemplating the possibility of being shot out of a volcano. In the meantime, up we went. The night passed in continual ascent. The din and uproar around us became more and more intensified. I was stifled and stunned. I thought my last hour was approaching, and yet imagination is such a strong thing that even in this supreme hour I was preoccupied with strange and almost childish speculations. But I was the victim, not the master of my own thoughts. It was quite clear we were being rushed upwards on a crest of an eruptive wave. Beneath our raft were boiling waters, and under these the more sluggish lava was working its way up in a heated mass, together with hordes of fragments of rock, which, when they arrived at this crater, would be flung out in all directions high and low. We were trapped in the shaft or chimney of some volcano. There is no doubt about that now. But this time, instead of Snaffle, an extinct volcano, we were inside one that was fully active. I wondered, therefore, where this mountain could be, and what part of the world we were to be shot out into. I had no doubt that it would be in some northern region. 
Before it had gone mad, the needle had never deviated from that direction. From Cape Segnusum, we had been carried due north for hundreds of leagues. Were we under Iceland again? Were we destined to be thrown up out of Hecla, or another of the seven fiery craters on that island? Within a radius of 500 leagues to the west, I could only remember on this parallel of latitude the not well-known volcanoes on the northeast coast of America. To the east, there was only one in a latitude of 80 degrees north, the Esk in Jan Mayan Island, not far from Spitsbergen. Certainly, there was no lack of craters, and there were some large enough to throw out a whole army, but I wanted to know which of them was to act as our exit from the interior world. Toward morning, our ascent grew faster. If the heat was increasing instead of diminishing as we approached the surface of the globe, this was due to local causes alone, volcanic ones. The way we were moving left no doubt in my mind. An immense force, a force of hundreds of atmospheres, generated by the extreme pressure of confined vapors, was driving us irresistibly on. But to what countless dangers it exposed us. Soon, wild lights began to penetrate the vertical gallery, which widened as we went up. To right and left, I could see deep channels, like huge tunnels, out of which escaped dense volumes of smoke. Tongues of fire lapped the walls, which crackled and sputtered under the intense heat. Look, uncle, look at that, I shouted. That's all right. Those are only sulfurous flames and vapors, which one must expect to see in an eruption. They are quite natural. But suppose they envelop us. Uh, but they won't envelop us. We'll be suffocated. We won't be suffocated at all. The gallery is widening. And, if necessary, we shall abandon the raft and creep into a crevice. But what about the water, the rising water? There is no more water, Axel. Only a sort of lava paste which is carrying us up on its surface to the top of the crater. The liquid column had indeed disappeared, replaced by dense and still boiling eruptive matter of all kinds. The temperature was becoming unbearable. A thermostat exposed to the atmosphere would have indicated 150 degrees. Perspiration steamed from my body. But for the rapidity of our ascent, we would have been suffocated. But the professor gave up his idea of abandoning the raft, and it was a good thing he did. However roughly joined together, those planks afforded us firmer support than we could have found anywhere else. About eight in the morning, something new happened. The upward movement ceased. The raft lay motionless. What's happening? I asked, shaken by the sudden halt as if by a shock. It's just a pause, replied my uncle. Has the eruption stopped? I asked. I hope not. I stood up and tried to look around me. Perhaps the raft itself, stopped in its course by a projection, was holding back the volcanic torrent? If that were the case, we would have to release it as soon as possible. But it was not so. The blast of ashes, scoria, and rubbish had stopped rising. Would the eruption stop? I exclaimed. Ah, said my uncle between his clenched teeth. That's what you're afraid of. But don't be alarmed. This pause can't last long. It's lasted five minutes now, and in a short time we'll resume our journey to the mouth of the crater. As he spoke, the professor continued to consult his chronometer, and once again he was right in his forecast. The raft was soon pushed and driven forward with a rapid but irregular movement, which lasted about ten minutes and then stopped again. That's fine, said my uncle. In another ten minutes, we'll be off again. We've got an intermittent volcano here. It gives us time now and then to catch our breath. This was perfectly true. When the ten minutes were over, we started off again with an even greater speed. We had to hold on tight to the planks of the raft so as not to be thrown off. Then, once again... The paroxysm was over. I have since thought about this strange phenomenon without being able to explain it. At any rate, it was clear that we were not in the main shaft of the volcano, but in a lateral gallery where there was some sort of counter-reaction. How often this operation was repeated, I cannot say. All I know is that at each fresh impulse, we were hurled forward with much greater force, and it seemed as if we were mere projectiles. During the short pauses, we were stifled by the heat. Whilst we were being thrown forward, the hot air almost stopped me breathing altogether. I thought for a moment how delightful it would be to find myself carried suddenly into the Arctic regions with a temperature 30 degrees below freezing point. My overheated brain conjured up visions of white plains of cool snow, where I might roll around and alleviate my feverish heat. Little by little, my brain, weakened by so many constantly repeated shocks, seemed to be giving way altogether. 
but for the strong arm of Pons, I would more than once have had my head broken against the granite roof of our burning dungeon. I have, therefore, no exact recollection of what took place during the hours that followed. I have a confused impression of continuous explosions, loud detonations, a general shaking of the rocks all around us, and of a spinning movement with which our raft was at one point whirled helplessly round. It rocked on the lava torrent in the middle of a dense downpour of ashes. Snorting flames darted their fiery tongues at us. They were wild, fierce puffs of stormy wind from below, like the blasts of huge iron furnaces blowing out all the same time. I caught a glimpse of the figure of Hans, lit up by the fire. All I felt was what I imagined must be the feelings of an unfortunate criminal doomed to be blown apart at the mouth of a cannon, just before the shot is fired, and flying limbs and rags of flesh and skin fill the quivering air and splatter the blood-stained ground. Chapter 44. Sunny Lands in the Blue Mediterranean. When I opened my eyes again, I felt the strong hand of our guide holding me by my belt. With the other arm, he was supporting my uncle. I was not seriously hurt, but I was shaken and battered and bruised all over. I found myself lying on the sloping side of a mountain only two yards from a gaping gulf, which would have swallowed me up had I leaned at all that way. Hans had saved me from death while I lay rolling on the edge of the crater. Where are we? I asked my uncle irascibly, as if he felt greatly put out by having landed on the surface of Earth again. The hunter, sh the hunter shook his head in a token of complete ignorance. Is it Iceland? I asked. Nay, replied Hans. What? Not Iceland? cried the professor. Hans must be mistaken, I said, standing up. This was our final surprise after all the astonishing events of our wonderful journey. I expected to see a white cone covered with the eternal snow of ages rising amidst the barren deserts of the icy north, faintly lit by the pale rays of the Arctic sun, far away in the highest latitudes known. But contrary to all our expectations, my uncle, the Icelander, and myself were sitting halfway down a mountain baking under the burning rays of a southern sun, which was blistering us with its heat and blinding us with the fierce light of its nearly vertical rays. I could not believe my own eyes, but the heated air and the sensation of burning left no room for doubt. We had come out of the crater half-naked, and the radiant orb to which we had been strangers for two months was lavishing on us from its blazing splendors more of its light and heat than we were able to receive with comfort. When my eyes had become accustomed to the bright light to which they had been strangers for so long, I began to use them to put my imagination right. In my op opinion, this had to be Spitzbergen and I was in no mood to give up this notion. The professor was first to speak, and said, Well, this isn't much like Iceland. But is it Jan Mayan Island? I asked. Nor that either, he answered. This is no northern mountain. There are no granite peaks capped with snow here. Look, Axel, look. Is the child dumb? exclaimed the professor, who, proud of his knowledge of many languages, now tried French. Still silence. Now, let's try a town, said my uncle. Dove no siamo? Yes, where are we? I repeated impatiently. But there was still no answer. Will you speak when you are told? exclaimed my uncle, shaking the urchin by the ears. Come si norma che se isola. Stromboli, replied the, little, uh, replied the little herd boy, slipping out of Hans' hands and running through the olive trees down to the plain. We'd hardly been thinking of that possibility. Stromboli! What an effect this unexpected name had had on my mind. We were in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, on an island of the Aeolian part archipelago, on the ancient strong isle where the god Aeolus kept the winds and storms chained up, to let loose at his will. And those distant blue mountains in the east were the mountains of Calabria, and that threatening volcano far away in the south was fierce Etna. Stromboli! Stromboli! I kept repeating. My uncle, accompanied by my exclamations, by clapping his hands and stamping his feet, as well as echoing my words, we seemed to be chanting in chorus. What a journey we had accomplished! How fantastic! Having entered by one volcano, we had issued from another more than two thousand miles from Snaefell and barren, faraway Iceland. The strange fortunes of our expedition had carried us into the heart of the most beautiful part of the world. 
We had exchanged the bleak regions of perpetual snow and impenetrable barriers of ice for those of brightness and the rich hues of all glorious things. Over our heads, we had left the murky sky and cold fogs of the frigid zone to revel under the azure sky of Italy. After our delicious meal of fruit and cold, clear water, we set off again to reach the port of Stromboli. It would not have been wise to explain how we had arrived there. The superstitious Italians would have put us down as fire devils vomited out of hell, so we presented ourselves in the humble guise of shipwrecked mariners. It was not so glorious, but it was safer. On my way, I could hear my uncle murmuring, But the compass, that compass, it pointed due north. How are we to explain that? My opinion is, I replied disdainfully, that it's best not to explain it. That's the easiest way to deal with the problem. Indeed, sir. The occupant of a professorial chair at the Yehanium, unable to explain the reason for some cosmic phenomenon? Why, that would be simply disgraceful. And, as he spoke, my uncle, only half-dressed in rags, looking a perfect scarecrow with his leather belt around him, setting his spectacles on his nose and looking learned and imposing, was himself again, the formidable German professor of mineralogy. One hour after we had left the Grove of Olives, we arrived at the little port of San Vicenzo, where Hans claimed his thirteenth week's wages, which was counted out to him with cordial handshakes all around. At that moment, if he didn't share our very natural emotions, at least his expression changed in a way very unusual of him, and while he lightly pressed our hands with his fingertips, I do believe he smiled. Chapter 45 All's Well That Ends Well Such is the conclusion of a story which I cannot expect anyone to believe, since some people will believe nothing against the testimony of their own experience. However, I am indifferent to their, incre uh, to their incredulity and they may believe as much or as little as they please. The people of Stromboli received us kindly as shipwrecked mariners. They gave us food and clothing. After we had waited 48 hours, on, on the 31st of August, a small craft took us to Messina, where a few days' rest completely removed the effect of our exhaustion. On Friday, the 4th of September, we embarked on the steamer Volturno, in the service of the French Imperial Messenger Service, and in three days we were in Marseille with nothing to bother us except that infernal lying compass, which we had mislaid somewhere, and could not now examine. But its inexplicable behavior occupied my mind terribly. On the evening of the 9th of September, we arrived in Hamburg. I cannot ex describe to you Martha's astonishment or Graben's jo jo joy. Now you're a hero, Axel, my blushing fiancé said to me. You won't leave me again. I looked at her tenderly and she smiled through her tears. How can I describe the extraordinary sensation caused by the return of Professor Lidenbrock? Thanks to Martha's gossiping, the news that the professor had gone off to find a way to the center of the earth had spread over the whole civilized world. People refused to believe it, and when they saw him, they would not believe him any the more. Nonetheless, the appearance of Hans and sundry pieces of intelligence gained from Iceland tended to shake the confidence of the unbelievers. Then my uncle became a great man, and I was now the nephew of a great man, which is a privilege not to be despised. Hamburg gave a great banquet in our honor. The professor gave a public lecture at the Johannium, in which he described everything about our expedition, with only one omission, the unexplained and inexplicable behavior of our compass. On the same day, he deposited in the city archives the now famous document of Secnusum, and expressed his regret that circumstances over which he had no control had prevented him from following the trail of the learned Icelander to the very center of the earth. He was modest notwithstanding his glory, and he was all the more famous thanks to his humility. So much honor could not but arouse envy. There were those who envied him his fame, and his theories, based on known fact, were in opposition to current scientific theories with regard to the question of the central fire, he maintained by pen and by speech notable discussions with scholars from every country in the world. For my part, I cannot agree with his theory of gradual cooling. In spite of what I have seen and felt, I believe, and always shall believe, in the Earth's central heat. But I admit that certain circumstances, not yet sufficiently understood, may tend to modify here and there the action of natural phenomena. While these questions were being debated with great animation, my uncle met with a real sorrow. Our faithful Hans, in spite of our entreaties, had left Hamburg. 
the man to whom we owed all our success, and our lives too, would not follow us to reward him as we would have wished. He was stricken with homesickness. Parval, he said one day, and with that simple word he left us and sailed for Reykjavik, which he reached in safety. We were very attached to our brave Eiderdown hunter, though far away in the remotest north, he will never be forgotten by those whose lives he protected, and I certainly tried to see him more than once before I died. To conclude, I have to add that this journey to the center of the earth caused a tremendous sensation throughout the world. It was translated into all the language of civilization. The leading newspapers printed the most interesting passages, which were commented on, picked to pieces, discussed and attacked by defended, uh, and defended with equal enthusiasm and determination, both by believers and skeptics. A rare privilege. My uncle enjoyed during his lifetime the glory he had deservedly won, and he may even boast the distinguished honor of an offer from Mr. Barnum to exhibit him on most advantageous terms in all the principal cities of the United States. But there was one fly in the ointment among all this glory and honor. One fact, one incident of the journey remained a mystery. Now, to a man eminent for his learning, an unexplained phenomenon is an unbearable hardship. Well, my uncle was still fated to be completely happy. One day, while arranging a collection of minerals in his cabinet, I noticed in a quarter the wretched compass which we had long lost sight of. It had been in that quarter for six months, little mindful of the trouble it was causing. I opened it and looked at it. Suddenly, to my intense astonishment, I noticed something strange and uttered an exclamation of surprise. What's the matter? asked me my uncle. The compass! Well, look, its poles are reversed. Reversed? Yes, they're pointing the wrong way. My uncle looked at it and checked it, and the house shook with his triumphant leap of exultation. A light suddenly shone into his, his mind and mine. See there, he cried as soon as he was able to speak. After our arrival at Cape Segnusum, the north pole of the needle of this blasted compass began to pull south instead of north. Clearly. Here, then, is the explanation of our mistake. But what phenomenon could have caused the reversal of poles? The reason is obvious, uncle. Tell me, then, Axel. During the electric storm on the Lindenbrock Sea, that ball of fire, which magnetized all the iron on board, reversed the poles of our magnet. Ha ha! shouted the professor with a loud laugh. So it was just a trick of the electricity. From that day on, the professor was the happiest of scientists, and I was the happiest of men, because my pretty Verlin girl, resigning her place as his ward, took her position in the old house in the Konigstrasse, in the double capacity of niece and wife. What need is there to add that her uncle was the illustrious Otto Lidenbrock, corresponding member of all the scientific, geographical, and mineralogical societies of the civilized world. That is going to be the end. Uh, normally I would go a bit longer, but the book has come to its conclusion. Uh, so that was Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed it. I thought it was, it was good right up until the very end. Um, and I'll be back. I'll pick out another book to read. I've got some ideas as far as what I might do next. And I hope that you'll join me then. Bye.